Hello everyone, my name is Eric Schimmelfenny and I'm the product manager at Avid CNC. At Avid CNC, we recently released a laser add-on kit for our machines. And our laser system, if you haven't seen it, is pretty unique. It features a pneumatic deployment system. So instead of having to uh, like remove and reinstall your laser or take your bit out of your machine, our laser comes in from the side and just deploys down when you need it and pulls up out of the way when you don't. So I thought for this presentation, I would show you uh, making a really cool project on it. And that project is this piece of terrain modeling. So this is a 3D carved terrain uh, that I did. And then I came back with the laser and added all the lines of topography in it. So I started with a two inch piece of maple, did some roughing and finishing tool paths. Uh, to get down. Then I came in and had a toolpath lay down on the 3D model to put in all the topography lines. Now this isn't the first time I've done a project like this and getting terrain, accurate terrain, into Aspire has been a little bit of a challenge. I'm um, in the past you had to do a lot of format conversions. Um, I would typically start in SketchUp because there uh, at the time it was an easy way to import uh, 3D terrain models in there. You could scale them up and down and kind of slice them and get the topography lines. Because um, SketchUp lends itself well to working with maps and sort of um, terrain and architectural models. Uh, well, I went back because I wanted to do this again with the laser and reevaluated the workflow and found that it's actually a lot easier now and a lot more accessible. So I thought I would walk you through how I made uh, this project. So to start, um, you need some 3D terrain. And uh, like I said earlier, I used to do this in SketchUp, but you don't need it anymore. Um, I found this site called Terrain2STL right here. You can just Google that and it comes up to uh, this website, jthatch.com slash Terrain2STL. Uh, and this is a website that allows you to zoom into a particular place on a map and get an STL file of that terrain. Um, there's a couple sites that do this. You don't have to use this one. Um, but what you're going to want to get is an STL file of the terrain that you want. Uh, so here I picked this area that's got some interesting, you know, water and some mountain ranges and things like that. And it's actually really simple to get what you want. So here I'll just hit center to view and we can go in here and you can kind of place the box where you want it and you can resize it a little bit like this. Now my piece of maple was an eight inch by eight inch square. So I'm, you, it's a little hard to get it exactly a square here, but I'm going to try to get it as square as possible. And we'll kind of get this right here, line this up. Um, then there's some settings here for water and base. And there also is a vertical scaling. I like to vertically scale it a little bit. Um, it accentuates the mountain ranges. So they show more detail when you carve. One thing you've got to um, be careful with, and it really depends on the, you know, the terrain where you are. You can't get something that is too steep that the laser can hit. Uh, that was something I had to take into consideration here in the scaling because um, that bolt got pretty close to some of these mountain ranges. But as you can see, I had about about an eighth of an inch in there, so I was able to uh, to clear it. Uh, so now that we've got our terrain selected, I can hit Generate Model and hit Download. Um, it's that easy. This used to be so much harder, uh, and it's fantastic that this is this easy to get a model like this. So I'll save my terrain in my Downloads folder, and then we are going to jump over to Aspire. And I'm going to set my material size to 8x8, eight eight, uh, my thickness to 2, because that's my starting thickness. Okay, so now we're going to go import that 3D model. And we do that by going to File, Import, and Import Component slash 3D Model. And I'll navigate here to where that terrain model was. In my case, it's Raw Model 236849. And we will go ahead and import it. Now it's important that we uh, pay attention to the setup here and we get everything um, correct because uh, oftentimes these STLs come in very large. And as you can see here, that's happened in this case. The thickness on this imported model is nearly seven inches. It's X and Y size is about five feet. So we want to change this. Uh, so I'm going to use eight. Uh, as my X direction and you can see it scales Y to 8.22 so we got it pretty close to square but not perfect 
and that's uh, pretty common when you're doing these things. It's almost impossible to get them perfectly square, but that's okay. Um, I'm actually gonna make this one a little bit oversized uh, for our material, and you'll see why in a minute. You wanna make sure here that you press apply, and when you do this, just make sure that your Z is at a reasonable, um, reasonable height. Right now it's about half the thickness of our, of our material and that's fine. Um, if you get a really low number or a really high number, you can change that here. Um, for example, if you brought in some terrain and it looked really flat, uh, you could sort of make it appear a little more 3D here. But this looks pretty good for what we're doing. Uh, so I like this. Last thing I'm gonna do is just press center model so it's centered in our material. And then we're gonna click position and import. And here we want to make sure that the terrain is above this plane here, the modeling plane. Uh, so we'll just bring this up and you know we don't want to lose any detail uh, down below. So I think I'm just going to bring all of this in and that should be okay. And we'll hit import and we'll let Aspire process for a second here. And then we should have our 3D model in the 3D view. And there we go. So um, if you see only like a little tiny piece of your terrain in here or some, you know, something looks weird, you may want to go back and re-import again uh, to make sure that it came in right. But this is looking really good. Um, we can just double check in our 2D view. Uh, we've got our, looks like our terrain came in well. And if you look here, you can see it is a little bit oversized. Um, to our material and again that's okay you'll see how this is going to work um, so next we need to slice this terrain up because i need two things out of here i need to create the 3d tool pathing to rough out the shape in 3d and then i need the 2d topography lines to do the lasering on so let's start by uh, creating the 2d topography lines um, the other thing actually that we're going to do right near the end is smooth this out. You can see this came through kind of chunky, uh, but that's okay. We're gonna, we're gonna deal with that as well, but we'll do that towards the end. All right, so let's start with getting our topography line. So we're gonna go over to the modeling tab and switch over to from the 2D view to the 3D view, if you haven't already done that. And there's a, a tool in here called the Slice Visible Model into Component Slices. And this is exactly what we need to get these topography lines. So there's a couple ways that you can slice up a model. You can uh, slice it to a particular thickness. Uh, you can do a fixed number of slices, or you can do it manually. And in this case, I want to do it manually because uh, I want to make sure that we get the water uh, that's in here because we want to fill that in with a nice hatch pattern. And so if you look down here, you can double click to select a selected slice height. You can shift and double click to add a new height. And you can shift and roll with the mouse wheel to modify the current slice height. So I'm gonna double click on this one here. And you can see I can, with shift, kind of roll up and roll down to change the height of this. So I'm gonna slowly move down here and I wanna get the water just right. And we can refer back to our terrain model, which I'll pull up here. So we've got water going all around and it goes underneath this island here and there's a little piece of an island here. So let's make sure we get that. So we'll go back to here and it looks like that little piece of an island didn't come in, but that's okay, we can, can draw that in later. Uh, but the rest of this looks pretty good. So I'm going to call this slice good. And I don't know, I actually kind of can't resist here. Maybe we can play with this one a little bit more. Yep, that's pretty good. We're going to keep that. So now I'm going to hold down shift and I'm going to double click up the side of one of these mountains here a little bit. And that's going to add another slice. You can see it in the slice menu here. And I'm going to shift and double click again, kind of go up here. That one looks pretty good. I'm going to shift and double click again to go here. Shift and double click again to go right here. And then one last time right near the top of this. You can do as many or as few of these as you want. I'm just going to do this many here for the sake of this demo. 
And if you do need to adjust any, you can click back through here and you can change the height of them um, as you see fit. But this looks pretty good, so I'm gonna go with this. And before we press slice model, you wanna make sure that create boundary vectors is selected because these are the things that we're gonna use to laser our topography lines on. So with that selected, hit slice model. And this sometimes, depending on how many slices you have, this is gonna take a few minutes in Aspire. Um, but here, since we only have five or six slices, this shouldn't take uh, too long and it's gonna update the model. And what you're left with is a, the original model here, the raw model, and a slice of each layer of your model. And as we turn these off one at a time, you'll see your models start to disappear in order. So we're getting a little lower, getting a little lower. And if you turn off the original model, you can really see these slices here. And that one's getting a little lower so on and so on. So we'll turn all those off, including the original model, and we're gonna go back to the 2D view. And we are left with the, essentially the topography lines that uh, we, we created. So this is great. Okay, now that we got these lines uh, cleared up, what we need to do, uh, we have a couple more cleanup things that we need to do here. Um, we need to make a giant pocket out of the water, um, and this is currently not a pocket. We also need to trim all of these vectors to the very edge, and sometimes what happens when you uh, do these topography lines, you get vectors that are not quite to the edge, and there are a couple ways that you can deal with this. Um, this one's not too bad, so I think I'm just going to go through here and manually uh, edit some of these vectors. So I'll hit N for node edit, and I'm just going to delete this line here. We'll just bring this one to the edge, and because that's really what we want here is for all of these lines to go right to the edge. And there, are, you know, very again various ways you can do this in Aspire. Um, I can use node edit here. Uh, which I think is a completely fine way. In this case, you can also use the extend vector tool to bring these to the edge. It's also an effective way to do it. I've done these before where a lot of the vectors along the edge are just a little bit shy, so you can make a big square and just uh, trim them all down. Um, you know, each terrain that you bring in is gonna be a little bit different and how you deal with it is gonna be a little bit different, but luckily, in Aspire, there are some great tools, um, you know, well, Aspire and any of the vector products, there's some great tools to clean up vectors like this. Um, I just lucked out here that this one is actually pretty decent to deal with. We need to make a big pocket out of this water uh, area here. And it's pretty large, and um, because of the way we clean these vectors up and the way we imported them, uh, it's not necessarily going to be a clean pocket. You can see when I pick this one, here, you know, this isn't the water, right? The water is, I'll pull up our STL here. Um, you know, our water goes up and down here and runs through and around this island. And these pockets aren't, they aren't correct. So, um, you know, I did use the scissor tool to go around and trim some of these, but uh, because it's right on the edge of the material, it's a little hard to see what's going on. So a trick I learned that you can do is to make this easier to visualize, you can select uh, all of the vectors and you can just scale them up larger than the material, up or down, um, it actually doesn't really matter. And you can see sort of some of the unconnected edges that we have here. And so what I can do is go ahead and I'll probably just use node edit and hit D for delete and just kind of clean up some of these lines here because what we want is to be able to make a continuous pocket out of the water. So I think we have most of these after that one there. Uh, and this one right here. Okay, uh, we've got those cleaned up. So now we can just use the line tool and I can connect this one to here and hit spacebar to start a new line. Connect this one to right here, hit spacebar to do a new line, connect this one to here, 
spacebar again. Connect this one here, spacebar. And this one's a little tricky because we have nothing to connect it to, so I'm just going to go way past the material. And we'll come to this one, and we'll come way down, because I want a nice 90 degree corner, so we'll just trim this with a scissor tool like that. And then we'll go back to our line tool and we'll connect this one here. And that should do it. Uh, Cause what we want is this, all of these to be one big pocket. So let's try it. So we're gonna select everything in here and we're gonna hit join open vectors and it's gonna have eight remaining vectors, which is okay. These ones here that are clearly wide open are gonna remain open and that's fine. We can laser those uh, that way, but let's click join and see what happens. So if I pick this one, that's great. We get a big pocket there. And then when we make our pocket toolpath, we can just select the island so that we don't get laser burning in there. This is perfect. So now what we can do is select all of this and we can scale it back down to our material. And I'm gonna unlink X and Y, and I'm gonna make this exactly eight by eight and hit apply. And there we go. That is uh, scaled back in really nicely. So now we can start making our laser tool paths. All right, before we get into the tool paths, however, there's one last thing we need to do to prep our 3D model. And that is that we wanna smooth it out. So if I go over to the modeling tab, uh, you can see in here we have a slice, a component for each slice that we made. And then we have that original raw model. Uh, we don't need to worry about the slices. We're just gonna check off the raw model so that we see it. And we're gonna go over the 3D view and you can see it's pretty chunky. Um, and this is just due to the quality of the STL that we imported. Um, but that's not a big deal because we can smooth it out in here. So in this modeling tab, there is a button called apply smoothing filter to selected components. So we'll do that. And typically what I find works is if you just put it all the way to the max and press bake and press okay. And sometimes the spire has to chew on this for a, a little bit, but it'll go. Um, and what you end up with is a smoothed over model. And what might throw you off, and this threw me off, but I figured it out in a few minutes here, is you end up in your component tree with a smooth model and then your original. So if you uncheck the original, you'll see the smooth model. And that looks great. Uh, this is gonna machine really, really nicely and have a nice uh, smooth appearance. All right, so let's get into making these tool paths. Uh, so one of the first sets of tool paths I'm gonna make is the tool paths to rough out and finish out this 3D carve on this material. Now, I started out with a two inch thick uh, piece of maple on this particular job. And what I wanted to do was um, keep as much of the thickness as possible so that um, I didn't have any like really thin spots and didn't cause the you know the material to warp or anything like that. Uh, so there are some checks you can do in here to ensure that you get the most out of your material. Now, I did kind of skip over these a little bit in the beginning because I wanted to take care of it more of when we did the tool paths. Uh, but we'll check here uh, the material thickness. I do have set to two inches, which is what I want. Um, and I also want to make sure that my tool paths when I do the roughing tool path, that the roughing tool stays within the boundary of the material. Um, so what I've done in the past is I've just slightly oversized uh, the, the 3D model, like just a little bit. Um, so my material is eight inches by eight inches, but I've got this at like 8.0679, so just a hair bigger. And um, again, that'll prevent when you make a roughing tool path, the, the bit to want to drop down on the side of uh, the material, especially if you've done some smoothing. Um, also another check too, since we are going to be making a roughing tool path, we want to make sure that our smoothed version of this is checked off and not one of our slices or our original raw model. Because uh, if we use the original raw model, we would have this unsmooth sort of chunky one. So um, the only one that you wanna have checked off is that smooth model here, um, the one that we just did previously. So 
with all of that checked, uh, we can get into making our roughing tool path. So I'm going to go back to uh, tool 2D view here, and I'm going to pick the 3D roughing tool path. And I've got a half inch ball nose bit that I used on this. Uh, worked pretty well. Uh, I ran this at 16,000 RPM at about 300 inches per minute, 200 plunge. Um, you know, depending on your machine setup and fit and material, this could all vary. Uh, so I'll hit apply and I'll hit select. And now what I want to do is for the machining limit boundary, I don't want to do model boundary. I want to do the material boundary. And like I was saying just a minute ago, that's going to make sure that the machining only happens in this eight inch by eight inch area. Um, and the, again, the bit won't drop down to Z if it's falling over the edge, uh, so to speak, of this material. So um, you'll see how this works in the, on the tool path here. So we've got that selected. Um, I'll make a boundary offset of zero. And my, my machining allowance, I'm gonna leave a little extra material on here for my finishing bit later. We'll do a 3D raster. Uh, and let's just hit calculate, see how this looks. Right, we'll go over to 3D view. Now this looks okay, but you can see it's taking a lot of material off the top. Now, um, <clears throat> we're gonna fix this. Now, remember I said a minute ago I wanted to keep as much of the material as possible? Well, if you look at what I have machined here, it's a fair bit thicker than what we're seeing in this preview here. Now this is, I'm gonna show you how to correct uh, what I think is a common mistake, or at least a common mistake that I have made, is that I didn't go back into the material setup here and change the position of the model. Now you can see, you can move the slider up and down and you can change where that 3D model is in the space of the two inch thick material that we have set. Um, the reason that we have this option is, is that our actual model here is not two inches thick. You can see it's sort of floating above the bottom of the coordinate system here. Um, and this thickness may vary. Um, it may vary depending on the Z height that you set when you make an STL. It may vary based on the area of the terrain that you pick. If you brought in the Grand Canyon, it may very well be deeper. Um, but in my case, like I said, I wanted to have as most of the wood as possible. So I want this model to be as close to the top as possible. And you'll see when I change that slider, it moves it all the way up to the top. And so if I hit OK, it's going to recalculate this tool path. And you should see we're going to have a lot less material taken off of the top. So that looks a lot better. Um, that's going to do... I think exactly what we want here. Um, and I also, you should note here that I'm zeroing to the table versus the material surface. And you may ask yourself, why am I, why am I doing that? Um, well, the reason is, is after we run this first roughing tool path, the surface to zero to will be immediately gone. Um, so what I'm actually doing in this case is zeroing to my spoil board surface, and that way I've got a repeatable zero because I'm going to change tools from this half inch uh, ball nose to a small eighth inch ball nose, and then eventually to the laser. And if I zero them all off the surface, that's a, a surface that's never going to go away. It's a, it's a repeatable uh, surface. So something to be aware of when you're doing these 3D carves. Um, you don't want to take away your zeroing plane because you could be, you could be left in a, in a bad spot. Um, so, all right, this toolpath looks pretty good. Let's go in here and make a 3D finishing toolpath. And I'm gonna go in here and select an eighth inch ball nose here. Uh, this path step looks pretty good for now. Step over, I think I'm gonna, gonna increase to 25%. And 16,000 RPM seems good, 300, 200. I think this is all fine. You know, again, all these settings really uh, can vary depending on the machine that you have uh, and the material. Uh, so let's just go ahead and hit calculate and see what happens here. And this will take a little bit to uh, to calculate. And this looks okay. I'm just going to turn off my roughing tool path and see what we have. Yeah, this looks excellent. Um, and I only need one step down on this because we had previously uh, taken away almost all the material with the, with the roughing tool path except for 0.04. 
um, which you can see right here. So this ball nose doesn't have a whole lot of work to do uh, in terms of material removal. So that's why we can do it in one pass, move pretty quickly, um, and have a reasonable step over. So uh, this looks pretty good. And we can now move on to making the laser tool paths. Now I said there was one last thing we needed to do. I really meant two last things that we need to do. Uh, we have our terrain smoothed over, but we also need to smooth, uh, or we should smooth these um, topography vectors out. And if we select uh, just a random one here and I hit node edit, you'll see that these have a lot of different little tiny nodes in it. Now the laser and the motion control system absolutely can do this type of detail. So if there was some reason that you wanted this level of detail, you could leave this in here. But uh, in my case, my experience doing these topography models, uh, if you smooth them out, uh, they go a lot faster uh, and they run smoother and the G code is just a lot smaller and a lot simpler. So uh, luckily there is a built-in tool into VCarve and Aspire to do this. So um, by selecting all the vectors, I can just go over here uh, to curve fit. And I typically like to do circular arcs. I'll keep sharp corners uh, and we'll set this at like 35 degrees. We'll just do a preview and see what this looks like. And that looks pretty good. Um, we kept our hard corners out here, which is, uh, which is what we want. Maybe we can try turning this off and see what it looks like. That's about the same. Uh, that's fine with me. I'll hit preview and okay. And so now when we go back into node edit, you know, as you saw in the preview, these vectors are a lot smoother. You can play with the settings on here. Um, you know, you can make these things like super, super smooth if you want. Um, it's really up to you. It's kind of a subjective setting. Um, but I would recommend on a laser tool path like this, where you're not doing text or uh, making a ruler, you know, something that requires really high accuracy that you put smoothing on, because things will just run uh, a lot smoother. Uh, so now that we have that sorted, uh, we can get started on making our tool paths for real this time. Now with our system, uh, the Avid CNC uh, laser system, we took a fairly unique approach, I think, to the creation of tool paths for it. You don't actually need specialized laser tool paths. You can use any routing tool path. And when you load a regular routing tool path into our Mach 4 controller, um, you can press a button and it will convert any routing tool path into a laser tool path. And it will sprinkle in all of the special laser commands and things that are uh, laser specific right in Mach 4. So you um, don't need to have a special post processor or anything else in Aspire um, or VCarve or anything else. And we did that because you can really unlock some interesting creativity uh, with some of these tool paths here. And so the setup is um, easy, but uh, not obvious. And what I would recommend, I'm gonna give you a, a, you know, how to set this particular job up here. I'll show you all the steps. Um, but if you go to avidcnc.com, you click on support, and then if you go to operation and projects, uh, there are two videos here that carefully walk you through um, how to do a vector, which is what we're gonna do here, and how to do a raster image burn. Um, they come with uh, sample photos, sample files, and sample G code you can look at uh, as well. But again, I'm gonna show you how to do this project here, but if you wanna learn how to do stuff like this and anything else, I would definitely recommend uh, checking out this site. So avidcnc.com, click on support and you'll find it. Uh, okay, so the, the premise is, let me just get back to Aspire here. Um, the premise is, is we're gonna essentially, to make this uh, water bed, uh, the water area here, we're gonna make a big pocket, uh, really. And again, that'll get converted into a, a laser tool pass. So let's select these two and we'll select a pocket and I'm gonna go select my laser, which is my 15 watt laser here. And you might notice if you're keen eyed, this is just set up as an end mill. Um, again, cause we, can, we wanna use a regular routing tool path and convert it to a laser tool path. Um, I've got the diameter here as 0 0.007 inches, which is the diameter of our laser. Um, we've got pass depth and step over here is set to 100%. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
and spindle speed is set to 80 RPM. And the reason that that's 80 is because we map RPM to laser power and laser power can be anywhere from zero to 100%. So if you set your spindle speed on your laser tool to 80 RPM, that translates to 80% power when it's converted in Mach. Um, also, another requirement for our laser is that it is tool 99 because we have two tools on any laser machine, the spindle and the laser. Uh, so we're going to come back and actually mess with these settings and I'll show you why, but we're going to start with these right here and we're just going to hit calculate and we're going to see what this uh, tool path looks like. And I'm just going to remove this. Uh, oops. We only want one tool in here. Uh, so we'll go ahead and hit calculate. Now you can see what happens here. Um, it did a pocket, uh, but this is really, really, really close together. And this would work. Uh, I mean, it would it would technically run, but you'd end up doing a lot, a lot of burning. It would be, I think, in my opinion, way too much burning. I like to see the lines spaced out a lot more. Not only does it take far less time, it'll look way better, um, but you kind of run into a problem. Um, you can't make a step over that is greater than the diameter of the tool. So. How do you make a step over? How do you make the spacing different? Well, you just lie to the software uh, and tell it the tool is a little bit larger. So I can just say it's 0.04 in diameter, and then I can make a step over that is 0.04. And we'll go ahead and hit, whoops, we gotta reselect our vectors here, that's okay. Just hit these and we'll calculate. And now we've got some really good spacing um, on our pocket here. This will actually, the 0.04 is kind of my go-to for stuff like this. Um, it'll look really good. Uh, you can set a profile pass as well. Um, that is one of the selections for the pocket, but you'll see that the profile pass is away from our vector. Well, we can uh, cheat that in as well by putting a pocket allowance of negative 0.04, I believe is gonna work. Um, I'm sorry, negative 0.02, half the diameter of the bit and that's gonna put that profile pass right on our line. And we've got an excellent pocket to, uh, to work with. Um, I think, again, 0.04 is gonna look great. You can see it on the 3D view here. That's some nice spacing. Now, if you're keen-eyed, you're gonna see that this tool path is hovering above our material. And if you ran this tool path that way, the laser would be up above the material and it would burn it, but it would not burn it well and it might wreck your work piece. So the one setting, if you remember one thing from this presentation and setting up these tool paths that you wanna make sure you do on every laser tool path uh, on a 3D model like this is that you check off project tool path onto 3D model. Really, really important. If I hit calculate now, watch what happens. This laser tool path is now uh, projected on top of this and you know we're riding up on some of these uh, you know some of the edges here and, and so it's going to lift the laser up you know as it goes through there and it will help you with clearance on these higher things so make sure you do that um, another note and I should have mentioned this at the top is you can edit the passes here um, in this case we just want one pass that's fine and typically I put the cut depth at zero uh, for all of my laser work because our laser Z zeroing will account for the distance that the nozzle needs to be above the material um, automatically. If you're a real advanced laser user, you can actually fool with this a little bit and you can push the laser beam down towards the material a little bit to get a wider burn path. Um, but for most people, most of the time, leaving this at zero and setting one passes, uh, one pass is fine. Uh, some other tricks you can do too, if you want, you can change the angle, uh, you know, of this, and um, you know, just for an aesthetic difference, uh, you can do that. Also, offset passes, um, offset pockets uh, work as well. No problems there. Personally, uh, having done some water, I'm a big fan of the raster toolpath over the offset toolpath, but uh, that is just a matter of opinion. So, uh, lastly, I'll just say laser. Uh, water, just so I know what my tool paths are, and I will click close. Now the water tool path is done. So the last one we need to do is we need to get these topography lines 
um, on on the top here. And this is actually one of the easiest ones to do. Uh, I'm just going to turn off our pocket here. Uh, we're just going to do a 2D profile toolpath. We're going to set a cut depth of zero, and we are going to select that 15 watt laser, and we'll just copy this. And uh, we'll just want to double check because we changed the diameter. Want to make sure that's back to 0 0.007 here. Uh, pass depth is fine. We're going to do this one at 80 RPM, 120 inches per minute for feed and plunge is OK. Tool number 99, that looks great. We'll hit Apply and Select. Now we're going to go through and select all of the these vectors that we want. Um, I'm actually just going to kind of cheat here and do a Select All. And whoops, I'll do a Select All and just select, deselect the 3D model and that pocket that we already did. Um, so we're going to make this an online toolpath. Again, one pass. And uh, we don't need any ramps. We don't really need any leads, anything like that. Um, critically, we want to make sure that we project toolpath onto 3D model. And we'll hit Calculate. And real easy, real fast toolpath. Let's go view it in 3D. That looks excellent. That is going to do exactly what we want. And again, I can't stress this enough make sure that you hit project model onto 3D, uh, uh, project tool path onto 3D model. Um, you know, again, you could end up in a situation w where you could be laser burning over something and get really undesirable results or even worse. Um, if your zeroing strategy is different, you can end up hitting uh, your tool into your material and you don't want that. So uh, really, really be mindful of making sure that uh, you have project model onto the material. Now, the other thing you just want to double check, and I had this happen a couple times, is you want to make sure that the laser tool is not diving off of the edge. And what I mean by that is I had a couple of instances where I had a stray vector that was sticking out past the material a little bit, and the laser tool path was you know, following along the surface of the material, and then it would drop over the edge like that. And the laser nozzle will follow that. And the problem with doing that here is if you had a tool path like that, you'd actually hit the nozzle um, into the side of the material. So um, we don't have any of those here. Um, it was cured by just going back and trimming the stray vectors. But you definitely want to like look around on a project like this to make sure you don't have any of that. But again, we are good here. So this laser tool path is ready to go. Uh, we can save this. and. We can actually save all of these tool paths uh, together. Or what I frankly typically like to do is uh, I do my routing tool paths first, and then I go back and I just load my laser tool path files, even though the system is capable of running both uh, back to back, um, kind of as a tool change. Um, but you, you can do that however you like. Uh, so that's how you set up those tool paths. Well, everyone, thank you very much for uh, checking out this presentation. I had a lot of fun designing and making this thing, and I hope you all get out into the shop and try something like this too. I thought this was a pretty unique way of using these different tool paths to make something interesting. Uh, maybe if I get some free time in the coming weeks, I'll finally put some finish on this thing and make a nice wood frame on it and uh, give it as a gift to one of my family members who's quite fond of uh, this lake. Uh, just a couple closing bits of advice. Really make sure you're projecting your tool paths onto your 3D model and be mindful of the clearance you have. Um, you know, Aspire, VCarve, all the different flavors of Vectric software, uh, you know, a lot of it's predicated on, you know, the diameter of an end mill. And one of the things you just want to keep in your head is that, you know, a laser is kind of like an end mill, uh, but it's a really tiny end mill, but it's got a lot of stuff around it. So if you're mindful of where that stuff is, you know, bolts, brackets, things like that, um, you won't run into an unfortunate situation where you hit your laser into something. And I will say, uh, as someone who has learned these workflows, I have learned them by making just about every mistake that can be made. And a lot of those mistakes could be mitigated by just simply uh, looking at the 3D previews, really checking things out closely, um, and asking questions and um, you know, running air passes, things like that. So 
you know, be careful, have fun. And once you get the hang of it, we would love to see some of the creative stuff that you do. I really believe that diode lasers are having a moment. Um, they're great add-ons for these machines, um, any CNC machine, because they're compact, they're powerful, uh, they can engrave and burn all kinds of different materials, and they're pretty resilient to dust and vibration and things like that. If you'd like more information, my contact information is here. Please feel free to reach out. Uh, we also have at Avid CNC a couple different resources that you can check out. If you go to avidcnc, avidcnc.com, you can click on support. And like I said earlier, if you go into operation and projects, uh, there's several tutorials in there. In particular, there are some laser uh, tutorials that I created that uh, I used to make this project. So if you want to go more in depth, you can go there. Uh, also, on the main page of our site, we have a community forum and we have a special section for laser work. And we've got a lot of people there doing some really interesting projects and we would love to see what you do. Uh, get in there, post what you've done, ask questions. Us in the community would be happy to help you. Uh, so again, thank you for taking the time out. My name is Eric Schimmelfenny from Avid CNC and really appreciate your time.